Uh-oh, we're live. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, this is our Hi. third hangout. To the Bible Unearthed, Israel Finkelstein, Neil Asher Silberman. Um, we read chapters 7 and 8. And let me look at the name of the chapters because I forget them. Uh, yeah, first chapters of part two. Uh, one state, one nation, one people, question mark. Uh, that's seven. And then eight is um, Israel's forgotten first kingdom. Are you sure? I thought that was six and seven that we read. Six yeah, six and seven. Six seven. See? If you can read that, I don't know. Did you read different chapters? <laughs> I read, I think I read the same ones you mentioned, but it was chapter 6 and 7 and not 7 and 8. Oh, did I say 7 and 8? I may have. That's my mistake. I meant 6, six and seven. 7. Yeah, not 7 and 8. Sorry about that. Um, Be watching It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> so yeah, anyway, um, these two chapters dealt with, um, at least from what I got out of them, was uh, the, like the last chapter we read, chapter 5, it touched on Davidic and Solomonic kingdoms again. And specifically in chapter 6, uh, was there a unified kingdom at the ostensible time that like, um, Kings is talking about? Um, and then chapter... Oh, I just got a warning, sorry. Chapter uh, 7 talked about what, they, what the authors are arguing was the, the real first monarchy, if you will, of, of Israel, which was um, the, um, what is, how do you say it, Amrite? Amride kingdom, which is King Omri, and then the, uh, his, uh, the people after him, Ahab, Ahaziah, um, Jehoram, those guys. So we're talking like late 9th century BC and forward. So um, anyway, what do you guys think about these chapters? Do you? The one thing I know is it seems like they're arguing that that really, I mean, at least from chapter seven, that the Davidic Solomonic kingdom really seemed to, as described, really seemed to be in the north, and it wasn't David and Solomon; it was Omri and his um, successors. Yeah, and the southern kingdom really had a bad case of envy going. Because, <laughs> you know, they were worthless crap as far as they were concerned, despite the fact that the archaeology suggests that they were probably a f really extensive, formidable, well-developed, technologically advanced uh, kingdom. Yeah, I'll say that there's some, that envy sounds pretty good, although... It may also be that as the the people from Israel refugeed south to Judah, that they wanted to recreate the kind of kingdom they had before, and they realized that they had to get some royal propaganda going to make it happen. And um, and in order to make that happen, they needed, need they wanted to make it seem like the south had been the one going had been the the big deal all along. So I guess I'm saying it could be some northerners moved south who did this anyway. But still you had the overriding ethos of the Deuteronomic history that saying, you know, it's the wealth, the power that led to their downfall. Does like Judah want to go through the same thing? Well, it wasn't the wealth and power that led to the downfall. It was the disobedience to Yahweh. Chasing after foreign gods, because they really did need feel the need to to um, concentrate the Jerusalem cult as being the, the controlling cult, and 
probably the tax collecting cult, which is always a real advantage. Yeah, um, one of the interesting things in chapter six that I liked was where it talked about the ecological and environmental differences between the highlands in the south around Jerusalem, and south of that, along the Dead Sea, and then um, the northern Israelite part. Um, they said that uh, the whereas the southern kingdom was had a lot more precipitous hills, I think they called it. Basically, it wasn't as easily traversed, and therefore it wasn't as amenable to um, easy and efficient trading and traveling and things like that. The northern kingdom, focused around Shechem, the hills were a lot gentler, and environmentally it was more, it seemed to be advantageous, especially for them, because it seems they were describing that wine vineyards and um, olive trees and making olive oil was a big thing in the in the uh, Israelite territories and that that economic advantage they're saying was probably one of the big things that started um, kind of gave a kickstart to what would eventually become a pretty powerful Near Eastern um, kingdom if you want to call it that centered around the north part, the Israelites. And the southern, even at the time that the, they were saying, even at the time that the uh, northern kingdom was basically, had become a kingdom, um, what was the word they kept using? A self... I forget what it was. But basically, you know, they, they had the ability to have administration over trade, um, have a standing army, things like that. Judah, by contrast, was still kind of stuck in that cycle that we t that we learned about in the last chapters, where it was they were still kind of just oscillating between pastoralism, agriculture, with some you know some settlements and villages here and there, well, which I, I thought was interesting because I didn't know that there was that ecological difference between those two parts of the highlands. He doesn't bring it up, but there's a lot of difference in the skeletons that are found from the north and the south. I don't know if this difference goes all the way back to this period, but you can tell from the skulls of people whether they were from the north or from the south. It, it seems like there was always some kind of a, a difference between the two peoples. Oh, so maybe some kind of ethnic difference too. Is that what you mean? I think so. Yeah, that's interesting. That's, that, they didn't bring that up in this book here. It's, it's kind of beyond the scope of, of Finkelstein because he's, he's an archaeologist. Um, you know, something that I found interesting uh, as I read the Bible in this book is, you know, there has a story here where Rehoboam, I guess that's the one who's Solomon's son, you know, he mm -hmm. wants to go on the big building spree. And so he tries to get the northerners to go along, and they say, nah, we don't want to be involved in all that. You know, we, we don't want to be called into building projects, so we're going to split off. You know, and, and yet it seems like the building projects really got kicked off in the north at this time. So it's almost like you have to wonder, was, there a re was the story reversed? You know, the northerners try to get the southerners to come on up and join in all the projects. They were the ones who said, no, we don't want to join up with all this. We're happy where we are. Yeah, it makes you wonder. Maybe there was kind of a role reversal in the portrayal. On the other hand, I could see, too, that it may just be that the southern peoples just couldn't get off the ground economically, just... You know, may maybe they weren't even asked to participate in the um, northern kingdom. But, yeah, who knows? I mean, it's hard to say. Well, the book specifically says that they were always a little bit economically challenged compared to the northern highlands. Yeah. Well, you know, there was a major trade route that went along the coast um, that, that, was, that they were always looking to, to con have control of, Egypt and you know, whether it was Syria or Assyria or Hittites, the 
people in the north. There was always this little struggle going on between the two great empires to control this this coastal highway, basically coastal highway. And so when you get to the southern group, they weren't really they were kind of isolated from this from this trade route. And then they had these forbidding mountains that weren't really good much for but for raising sheep and goats. Um, which, you know, I, I hate, I think people were bored with the whole pig controversy last week. But, you know, when you have really high mountains and um, you, you can't plant those, you can't plant the area because the soil is too rocky and thin, then really about the only thing you can do is raise sheep and goats. That's, you know. So did the north, I wonder if, it, if the north at some point because the trade route, are you saying it, it was along the coast, like in the lowlands part, basically? And what, what they're describing is there was still like remnants of, of the former glory, if you will, of the, of the before the, of the Canaanite peoples, basically. Because they're saying, you know, at the end of the, at, in, during the late Bronze Age, there was kind of that generalized collapse, including among the, um, the Canaanite city. States, well, if you want to call them that. the Canaanite cities were actually part of the. I'm sorry. I, I, okay, were part of the Egyptian Empire, so that um, you know Egypt had control of them. They sent some taxes and stuff down to Egypt, and when they had trouble with invaders, Egypt would come up and take care of them. And we know about this arrangement through the Telamarna letters, which are mentioned mm -hmm. in the book. So. When the when the in the collapse of the Bronze Age, Egypt basically just couldn't maintain that kind of control over the area, and none of those cities were walled. I suspect it's because Egypt wanted to be able to go ahead and send their army right on in and take control of that city if the if the leader wasn't the mayor or the king or whatever wasn't doing to their specifications. So, cities were no longer protected. They collapsed, and um, that that's why you you had this. Uh, sorry, sorry, I forgot where we were going with this. But that's why you had this the collapse at the end of the Bronze Age, and um, <clears throat> I think that the coast the coastal area was kind of taken back at a later time by Egypt when they sent the Philistines in to control those areas. Right, the Philistines were their enemies when they were the Sea Peoples, but they they reached a sort of agreement with them that okay, look, you know, let's be friends. We'll send you over here to this area where we need a little help um, maintaining order, and you, you could conquer this area, and as long as you don't fight with Egypt anymore. Yeah. So, and they, they, it seemed like they were saying that. Um there were Phoenicians too in that area. Um, yeah, the Phoenicians were um, their their capital area was Tyre and Sidon, uh, especially the I island of Tyre, and they were uh, a seafaring people. But I think that they were really more of a later group. That you, you had the the height of the Phoenicians during the Peloponnesian is it the Peloponnesian Wars um, between them and um, the Romans in probably nah, second, third century BC. Okay. So, well, what I was wondering was. Um, I think the, the Phoenicians were actually descendants of the Sea Peoples. When you look at the cities that we call Phoenician cities, like Dor, um, in the late Bronze, around the time of the late Bronze Age, they're inhabited by Sea Peoples. Oh, okay. So there may be some lineal connection there. Yeah. Well, what I was wondering is if the if the northern Israelite kingdom had access to this trade route, is that what you're saying? Whereas the southern didn't really have it, or maybe didn't really have anything to offer. 
Um, it, it was kind of both. They were isolated from it by their forbidding mountains, and then they didn't have a lot of agriculture. In the north, they had these, as well as they having more fertile mountainside type territory, they also had the fertile valleys that you mentioned. Yeah, you Jezreel. Exactly. And in the north, there just wasn't that there. So people who raise sheep and goats, you know, they don't, they, they probably didn't have quite a lot of trade things to trade, offer to trade, and then they had a very rough terrain to go over in order to get to the trade routes if they did trade, say, animal skins, which is, you know, kind of all they've got because you can't really, you can't do a lot of preserving of meat. So they wouldn't really be able to say like like now you know you can freeze some meat and you can ship it all over the world, but you can't do that then. Yeah, another interesting thing I found that just kind of adds more weight to the marginality of the of the of Judah at the time was the that inscription talking about um Shalmaneser or Shalmaneser however you say it the Assyrian king Shalmaneser the third talking about battles and with the Israelite kingdom and none of the there's the uh, also the uh, Mesha inscription I think they were saying something like that they don't even really acknowledge that there's like a Judah a kingdom of Judah they're just a they're not even mentioned. Like they're not a, a player on the on the ta on the uh, on the stage, you know. Which again just adds more weight to the general argument of this book that there's just really no evidence for what's described in the Bible, where the unified kingdom in the 10th century was really where everything was happening. Seems like it was happening in the north. In the eighth or ninth century, um, and then again, they said that that's why a big reason they they redated the, like the um, six chambered gates at uh, Megiddo and Gezer and Hathor. That said, they're saying it wasn't Solomonic, where a lot of archaeologists before had put it in that time period, like the stable, the pillared stable buildings and all that. It all seemed to be uh, from the Omride kingdom and had the same architectural theme. Pottery shirts were similar style, etc. So, yeah, I think they make a really good case about that. Yet, biblical apology sites will still name all of these er will will name all of these these archaeological diggings that that he mentioned as being Omride, they will still tell us that those were evidence for David and Solomon, and they still tell that to people who go to the churches. And so it's kind of frustrating that this has been debunked for years and years now, but it still gets it still gets spread to the faithful. Yeah. The other thing, too, is, um, you know, there's plenty of evidence for this Omride kingdom, and... I mean, they talk, too, about these extensive and beautifully crafted, as far as the quality of the craftsmanship, ashlar, uh, these buildings made of ashlar blocks, ashlar stones. All this stuff, there's extensive remnants of it all in the north. But when we look where, again, where we look where in Jerusalem and anywhere in Judah at, for, for that time period, there's just nothing like that, you know. So it seems, yeah, it seems strange that people are still trying to argue because if, the, if there's this stuff in the north, all the more reason it should be in the south too, you know, even more extensive if that's, that was the, cent, the cent, center of this vast uh, Davidic Solomonic kingdom. Um, I'm trying to remember what else. You know, to me, these two chapters were a ton of really interesting archaeological uh, summary, basically. But the most riveting parts were when they were paraphrasing the biblical accounts. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like that they do that. They 
they they really kind of give you the, the background biblical information then go into saying, you know, here's where it's right or here's where it's wrong, which is helpful, especially for me because I'm not really familiar with these stories that, that much. So. Um, I found his whole analysis of the, um, the Shishak invasion to be kind of interesting because he... Um, in his footnote, you know, he said, well, there's also a possibility that the Amrites caused the destruction that he's attributing to the Pharaoh Shishak, and um, he seems to be puzzled as to why Shishak would have made this invasion, but yet it was not an invasion of conquest. But I, I think that these aren't necessarily um, in conflict with each other. If you've got a weakened empire like Egypt was at the, after the, the Bronze Age collapse, um, they're going to want to have a, a large buffer area between them and the next centers of power. Even if they don't have full control over that area, they want to make sure whoever does control that area is either friendly to them or not at least, or at least not a threat to them. So we say maybe you know we have this war that's that's talked about constantly during the time of of David of struggles between the people of Israel and the Philistines, who, as we've noted before, were friends of the Egyptians. So it could be that Shishak went ahead and went up there and sort of spanked whoever was in charge at the time and you know kind of created a little chaos in order to make room for another group to, to rise up and take power a group that perhaps would not be as antagonistic toward the Philistines because I, I think I might be wrong but I think I remember the wars with the Philistines pretty much get dropped right about the time that um, Second Kings comes into play that the David and Solomon stories are over and even the David stories, there's no more struggle with the Philistines. And um, not that they're they're all friends in one nation, but I'm saying that you know perhaps when when um, Om, well Zimri was the one who who was the one that rose up, but when the the Omride group rose up, that they didn't really take on the Philistines, and maybe they had a there was a little secret agreement that you know if the Pharaoh would take out the people who were in charge in that area that the people who came into power were going to not challenge Egyptian interests. Well, could it also be that uh, they intended to, Egyptians intended to uh, conquer and continue to occupy that land, but they were overextended or they were going through a period of decline themselves. They just couldn't maintain that kind of occupational thing, and that's why uh, you know, the Canaanite city has never recovered. Um, well, you're, the, the Canaanite cities that never recovered were already dust by the time Shishak made his invasion. Um, <laughs> they, that they, that the, the Bronze Age collapse happened and Shishak came after that and so did and those cities collapsed at that time and then a little bit later they were reoccupied and they kind of built back up. So maybe a little more complex than just, you know, it collapsed and then Shishak went back, went in to, to take out those cities because they couldn't take care of them anymore. I'm trying to find that part. There was one thing about the Shishak thing that uh, it's a chapter six if that helps yeah um, yeah it was a footnote the Shishak alternative that's the alternative explanation to the, that these the destruction of these cities these Canaanite cities um, Rehov, Beth Shean, Tanakh and Megiddo um, you know there's two theories the one you mentioned that Shishak a Roman pharaoh or Roman Egyptian pharaoh <laughs> came up and took him out, but the but the alternative too that you talked about was the Omri one. But there was this interesting footnote that that Omri, Omri did it. 
or someone in that. Which king would it have been, by the way, at that time? Do we know? Can we nail it down? Would it have well, been Omri or Ahab? Or there was there was um, uh, Ahab was a descendant of Omri. There was this guy yeah. named Emery that's the first one that that's kind of mentioned as being um, taking over after Jeroboam. I think after Jeroboam was wiped out. Um, that's was, right. The Boam and Jeroboam group, and then Jeroboam goes down in flames, and Zimri arises, but he's only he only takes over for a short period of time. It's it's like the army takes over, and then the army has a series of assassinations or something, and Omri comes out on top. Yeah, and he's the one that's that basically found Samaria. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. But you know, uh, I noticed. I'm sorry, but I've noticed with um. With mo with monarchies and their dynasties is that you'll have uh, Omri plays the part of the founder of the dynasty, and those guys usually founding the dynasty is about all they get to do, because they have to they spend their lives in military conquests and then they plan a, gr a glorious empire which is then with building projects and stuff which is then implemented by the descendants like. What happened with Ahab? It's Ahab who actually built most of the monumental palaces and stuff. Yeah. Anyway, this footnote was interesting. It says the Shishak alternative raises a problem. Why would the Egyptian king destroy the cities in the Jezreel Valley if he intended to continue dominating Canaan? And why would he erect an elaborate victory stell in a destroyed city like Megiddo? Again, could, yeah. Why would you erect a stell if the if the if the city's destroyed? Well, or of course. Thiele, whatever. And he says another possible candidate for the agent of destruction of the Canaanite cities could be the Northern Kingdom of Israel. So the Amorites. Yeah, and that that was what I was proposing was an answer to this question that Shishak never really intended to actually conquer the area, but that he just intended to collapse whoever was in power there. In order to um, perhaps they were offering some kind of um, say threat to him and his trading interests or to the, to the his allies the Philistines so that he doesn't necessarily have to conquer the area he has to just create a power vacuum to get rid of his enemies. So you're saying this opened the door for the Omrides to kind of finish the job, if you will. Yeah, and um, I think that that's something that that. Um, Finkelstein is saying here is why yeah. the rise is because there was this this power vacuum that was created after the invasion by Shishak. Right. Yeah, so that would have been part of the rise of the northern kingdom or northern people. There, there was a power vacuum that needed to be filled and they had an economic advantage due to their, you know, ecological benefits of just the territory, the lay of the land in the north. And also I have to wonder, we were talking more about the influence of the sea peoples who moved into the area and it may not have just been the Philistines, perhaps even what we call the tribe of Dan with another group. And as if these people were from outside, they may have been uh, more progressive you know, um, more advanced in some of their technology and in some of their um, administrative abilities and stuff. And it may be that their influence also is one of the reasons why um, the people of the North began to coalesce and organize. Yeah, another interesting thing that I liked was they mentioned that the northern kingdom would have been ethnically more diverse than Judah and they're saying that that you know we even get hints of it in the Bible kind of indirectly when, when it's talking about Ahab and Jezebel um, you know he's building shrine at Bethel to Baal for her sake kind of and she's inviting in a bunch of priests um, what was her where did she hearken from? She or, was Phoenician actually Phoenician. her yeah. was King of Tyre. Yeah, but um, and then archaeologically they're saying that well, yeah, it would have been 
ethnically more diverse, and this could have been a big part of the reason that there seems to have been more um, uh, more idolatry, if you want to call it that, more oh, influence wow. of foreign gods and stuff like that. If you want to talk about ethnic diversity, just the fact that they talk about there being ten tribes in Israel versus one tribe in Judah, that's kind of interesting too, because they all, that, that makes only eleven tribes. Like, you know, Benjamin was sort of an afterthought that made twelve tribes later on, or something. But um, yeah, you know, just the fact that, that that they're talking about this greater number of tribes in the north would indicate that there was a more diverse group of people going on. Is Manasseh the the half tribe? Would that is that counted? I don't know if Reuben's listening. He would know. Yeah, Reuben would know. But that Manasseh was the half tribe. Um, it was supposed to be, you know, formed from the sons of jo Joseph. Yeah. Oh yeah, Reuben put it there. The tribe of Joseph is divided into Manasseh and Ephraim. So, Reuben, are they, when, when we talk about the 12 tribes, Manasseh is not part of that count, right? Just Ephraimites? Both are, okay. So, how come Israel has 10 tribes and the South has one tribe? That only comes up to 11 tribes. What happened there? Actually, all I'm doing is, is going by what um, Finkelstein says. He says that you know the ten strips were given to Jeroboam, and you know Rehoboam was to keep the one. Yeah, that was uh, one of the prophets, right? Elijah or Elisha ripped up his clothing. Was that right? Or no, just a man of God, I think it says. Yeah, a heel, uh, something like that. Oh. oh. His name started with an A. I'm thinking Ahila or something like that. It, it was a guy that the only time this guy ever appears. Was that in chapter 7? It was in chapter 6. It was, okay. Yeah, where, I want to find that because that was an interesting part. It's probably toward the beginning, right? Because that's where they lay out the, uh, the back story, kind of. I think that's right. I'm wrong. Yeah, tale of twelve tribes and two kingdoms. Tribes of the north: Benjamin, Manasseh, Ephraim, Zebulun, Asher, Naphtali, and Dan. They didn't, they didn't finish off the Canaanites, um, and they, as a result, they'd be tempted again and again by idolatry. Where did it talk about that? Yeah, Rio Bone seems like a real jerk, too. <laughs> yeah. Because that's what they described really was the, in the in the biblical story, that's his refusal to lighten the tax burden on the northerners was the kind of watershed moment for them kind of splitting in the, into two separate kingdoms, right? It, it was a burden, though, but I think what we're talking about is a labor burden. And not oh, really? Tax burden. Um, during the Egyptians, and probably at this time too, uh, poor people paid their taxes by um, providing labor to the pharaoh or the king for their building projects, or that was one way it was done. So what these people in the north, according to the story, they didn't want to come down south and do any more building. They'd already helped build Solomon's temple, and they didn't want to have to go down there and build any more stuff. That's why I was talking about it seemed kind of strange that they would be all they would be all upset about Rehoboam wanting the 
make them come and, and participate in building projects, and then they go up north and they start making some even bigger ones up there. It it seems like a you know it doesn't quite make sense. Yeah, and they're told that the, all the northern kings are vilified in the story. That's part of the propaganda you were talking about earlier that they talk about in the book. Um, yeah, you know, for instance, I, you, you can look at the story of Naboth in the vineyard. And um, when you see the archaeological evidence, they have built some just fantastic structures during his reign. But you know along the way, people had their land taken away. Oh, because, yeah. you know, that's just how it works. And, you know, I mean, when you look at things... In, in contemporary times, you have one of these big projects, they buy a bunch of people out and most everybody just is either happy to take the money or just takes the money because they know that's just how it's going to be. But there's always one or two people that don't want to just take the money and want to make a big stink about it. And it could very well be that Naboth was such an individual and perhaps, you know, there was a person named Naboth or somebody or some people that were like this that had their land taken away and so then you know the northerners get this propaganda yeah 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 Ahab and his building projects but did you hear what he did to Nava? you know yeah, he, stopped, he trampled on the small folk exactly to do all this stuff yeah I'm trying to find that part about the ten pieces of the garment Cannot find it. I think it might be near the beginning. Yeah, that's where I was looking. Reuben's saying they wouldn't account as the, Le the Levites anyway because they're they're just the priests, so they don't get any inher any inheritance anyway. They just get the temple duties. Page one sixty four. Oh really? Well, I was way off. Okay, it's the prophet Ahijah made a startling revelation to Jeroboam. This is from a different book. Take thee ten pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel. Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and will give ten tribes to thee. And he's talking to um, Jeroboam, right? Right. Yeah. right. Telling him that he's going he's gonna to cut off the kingdom of Israel from um, Jeroboam because he's uh, a Rehoboam because he's been a piece of crap to everybody. <clears throat> well, wasn't there some thing where Re like Rehoboam was the real bad guy, but Jeroboam ends up getting kind of punished for it, right? Um, well, Jeroboam, you know, he's not properly appreciative of, of what Yahweh has done for him. Right, he goes a whoring off too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, this very <laughs> prophecy comes to him, you know, that, you know, he's going to be destroyed, but later on this great king named you know, Josiah is going to rise up and restore the kingdom of Israel. Doug, is my book numbering different from yours? No, that's the right page. I found it. Yeah, the, in the parentheses where you read, I'm about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon, I will give you ten tribes, but he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because he has forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, 
Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the Ammonites. So who's getting the one tribe? Jeroboam? No, oh, Rehoboam, the one in the south. Okay, yeah. Solomon. Jeroboam was northern. Right. Yeah, okay. And I, for people who, who talk about these things, you know, it, it does to be, seem to be kind of interesting how often the king of Israel and the king of Judah have rhyming names. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, maybe they're just making up some, but one, one person's sort of been made up, you know, just, <laughs> I don't know. What's, what are the, I wonder what the names of the, of the, um, what the names mean. Like Boam, what does Boam mean? Well, I think we're looking for somebody who speaks Hebrew. Let me see if I can look it up. Oh, uh, the people contend, or he pleads the people's cause. It is alternatively translated to mean the people are many, or he increases the people, or even he that opposes the people. In the Septuagint, he is called Hierobon, and then Rehoboam. He who enlarges the people, same thing. Huh. Yeah, I'm thinking that in some of these king lists, they don't really know who the king of Judah was, or maybe there really wasn't much of a, a central leader at the time and so they just sort of made up a shadow figure that that matched more or less the is the the guy who was in Israel because they wanted to show an unbroken line of of dynasty sort of like how um, the Pope lists and then you can also find some ancient king lists examples of this sort of thing where there's there's you know some time period where they don't really know what happened but the historians just sort of plugged in some stuff to create an, an illusion of continuity. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that happened a lot. Um, the other thing they were talking about in the book, too, is these guys possibly were just like chieftains, you know, like rural chieftains, you know, not really kings, obviously, because their argument is there wasn't a kingdom at all until the Amri dynasty. That was the first kingdom that there's archaeological evidence for, and that's ninth century. Right. So you know, maybe there's a David and Solomon, or you know, particularly maybe a David, who's you know a big chief, collected quite a bit of money, got quite a bit of prestige, and um, kind of more or less had things organized, and then maybe his family sort of collapses for whatever reason. And there's a few generations where there's nothing, and then somebody else sort of rises up who's really there. And so by the time of Josiah, where all this is being written down, they don't really want to talk about there being these gaps where nothing is going on. So mm -hmm. they so they go to so they go ahead and they make up some guy who's more or less a correlate of whoever was in Israel at the time. Yeah. Hey, in the future, maybe we could read 
some more Finkelstein stuff. He does have a book on David and um, Solomon that I haven't read yet. Of course. Is that the Forgotten Kingdom? No, the Forgotten Kingdom is all about the North and goes into some of this stuff in greater detail. And there's actually a PDF of it. And I've read that, and it's really good. I would recommend that we go into that, too, at some point. Okay, yeah, that's definitely a possibility. Yeah, the the eighth chapter, I'm sorry, the seventh chapter especially, you know, it's it's difficult to talk about fully on this hangout because a lot of it was just describing, like, specific archaeological details of some of these ruins, like, the you know, the, the carved uh, well tunnels they had and the... Uh, particular architecture, style of the pottery, um, stuff like that. So, so for for any archaeology buffs out there, that chapter seven would be really, really great for that reason. Um, something that I found interesting was that um, when Jeroboam allegedly builds the shrines, he builds one in Bethel and one in Dan. Yeah. And they're golden calves. Yeah. So who is the golden calf god? Yeah, because that's what the people build while Moses is up on the mountain, right? Exactly. Yeah. Wasn't it Baal or something? Isn't that Baal? Um, I don't know. Um... You know, what I, something I find interesting is that they're, they're worshipping a calf, whereas, you know, when you're, you know, in religions that, that have, a, have a, you know, cattle as their, as their god, it's usually the full-grown version, either the bull or, as um, Dale mentions, the Egyptian god Hathor, I think, was, was actually a goddess and was represented by the female cow. Is that not right? Right, that is Egyptian. The Apis bull was sacred. Okay, right. this is the full-grown version, and I have to wonder why are we worshiping a calf? Exactly, who was that? Yeah, it makes you wonder because the Egyptians they would have they would always have an Apis bull, and it had this like you know amazing stable that they would house it in, and then when it died, they would have another one. There's and a lot always of controversy have over which one it is. Generally speaking, critical scholars say it was probably Yahweh. The bull? Yeah. Yeah, it makes you wonder. Yeah. So they're saying that the golden calf was meant to be a representation of Yahweh, but it was um, wrong to make this golden calf because you weren't supposed to make any representation at all? Right. Moloch was a Canaanite. God too, wasn't he, or Moabite, something like that? Um, didn't they just mention him? Yeah, as being an Ammonite, or um, that it, it was just in that passage that you were just reading. No, that was Malcolm and um, a different one. That wasn't Moloch. It was Malcolm and one other one. Where was that? What was the context of that? Oh, talking about Jeroboam. Must have been the wrong one. Yeah, he said Malcolm is Moloch. Etymologically related, a lot of these. Yeah, Ash, Ashtoreth, the goddess of Sidonians, Chemish, or Chemish, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the Ammonites. Okay. Oh, it is, Ruben saying it is Moloch, just a different transliteration or whatever. General Levantine god, Milcom is a Moloch. Moloch, also known as Moloch, Molech, Molech, Moloch, blah, 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 a bunch of different spellings. Okay, cool. Well, of course, we have to remember that ancient Hebrew doesn't have vowels, right? Right, yeah. So yeah, maybe that's what it was. Maybe it was Moloch of the Ammonites that he... Who else in that region would have, besides Apis and Moloch, were there any other depictions of 
gods as in the form of a bowl. MLK, king. That's the root Ruben saying. It's kind of interesting that the the somebody else mentioned, you know, that the golden calf was from Egypt and um, the, they placed the golden calf in Dan and uh, you know I'm kind of working on my theory still that the the tribe the Denyan or the Noi actually became the tribe of Dan and, and I'm thinking that the the story coming from Egypt comes from them that they it's people they may have worked or another group poss possibly who came from Egypt um, that they worked for the Egyptians for the for a while, fought with them, and then later were transplanted to the north, and that the stories of Moses and the escape from Egypt are coming from them. And they would have brought this Apis bull god with them. Or, yeah, the golden calf, whoever it was. But it's probably not Apis, because as, um, as I was pointing out, the Apis is usually is a, a full-grown bull, right? Yeah. Yeah, it be the difference between you know, of you know, a full, virile man and we're in as a god versus a child as a god. And also, L was a bull. Oh, really? Yeah, I think in some of the Ugaritic depictions, or maybe I'm mistaken about that, but there are depictions of L as a bull. Hmm. Reuben has another interesting note here. He says, in all cases, they have the same root, MLK, King. <laughs> Martin Luther King. I thought of that, too. The inhabitants of Samaria will fear for the calf of Beth Avon. Indeed, its people will mourn for it, and its idolatrous priests will cry out over it, over its glory, since it has departed from it. This could be our origin of the golden calf story, the calf of Beth Avon. Hmm. Yeah, maybe so. It's hard to say. I mean, the pedigree of all these gods probably just got all transformed and evolved and jumbled up through history, you know. So they probably share a lot of them. Probably share if you if you trace them back, some a few common origins. And maybe I shouldn't make the distinction. After all, in Christianity, we we celebrate Jesus the man and we also at other times celebrate Jesus the infant but it's still supposedly the same God yeah well, what occurred to me was that if um, <clears throat> if the high God is a bull that these other gods like Baal sons of this God might be depicted as calves interesting yeah That would make sense. I mean, anyway, um, do you guys have anything else on the uh, chapters there? We didn't really read a ton today or this week, and like I said, a lot of it was just kind of detailed archaeological stuff. I don't have too much to add, but on the question of the golden calf, I'm actually thinking that should be plural. I think there are calves, plural, that it's actually talking about. In in the story, in the, the, the passage we were reading, it, um, there are two calves made, and they're put in different cities. And then I think the story in Exodus is actually written later and derivative from this. But it even has the plural at one point in, in Exodus. In the prohibition and stuff, it has a plural. Oh, interesting. Huh. I think so, that but, to, to the question of trying to identify who the calf is, you may want to consider it could be singular or plural. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, maybe there was a lot of calf signifying the sons of El. The 70 sons of El. Well, of course, to those people at that time, the bull would make the perfect symbol of a fertility god. 
because of being a big powerful animal that it impregnates a lot of females. You know, you don't you don't have cat cattle in pairs. You have one cat, one bull, and he services a whole herd of females. And you know, that's fertility and it's power too. You know, the cattle they not only provide lots of meat, they also are work animals that that can pull plows and stuff and so they have to fertilize the ground. Yeah, Ruben quoted the passage for you, good. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, like an eti etiological myth, you know. Why are there two? Well, because he set this up for, you know, alternate places of worship for the northern kingdom. But, you know, that may not be originally why they were, that's just an explanation of why they were. You mean why there are two shrines? Yeah. Still, it's interesting that that it's a bull that he uses as the as the if, if it's etiological. Oh, calves. Or yeah, calves. Why is it two calves rather than say two whatevers? You know. Well, that it would have to be that that was the favored the, that that was a favorite god or a favorite um, depiction of god for those people because you know he's trying to win their favor. And it says here that you know that you don't have to go all the way to Jerusalem, which of course I'm thinking the Jerusalem cult is saying, hey, you know he was bad for putting all these shrines up everywhere for your convenience because you're really supposed to go down to this main one in Jerusalem. But he wouldn't have put up golden calves, I don't think, unless that was something that people were already worshiping. It was already a big favorite with them, and that he was trying to unify them under his under his banner. Oh yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that that I mean, you can just see, especially in the Book of Judges, where they talk about <laughs> every time that you know a judge comes up, and then the people go start worshiping some god foreign god, and everything goes to shit, and then another judge comes up, and they get whipped into shape. Ah, uh, but then he dies, and the, they start worshiping other gods again. It's like there was a constant flirtation with other gods, which I think a lot of that's just um, retroactive, like storytelling about the real history of Israelites. That that there was a diversity among this group of the gods they worshipped. They probably worshipped a lot of them, and then once the Yahweh cult was like the main thing and they're going back and telling this history they're trying to say oh yeah look at these these bad things we did by worshiping these other gods that look how bad we were and that's why we're, Yahweh punished us you know but really it was probably just just or, totally ordinary at the time to to worship all these gods it probably wasn't a problem until later on Anyway, any last thoughts or any other thoughts? No, I think Shauna said everything I was going to say. <laughs> Sorry, John. Here, too, we touched a little bit. They touched a little bit on um, the, this whole depiction of uh, the northern kingdom again seems to harken back to a 7th century concern. Is that right? Under Josiah, yeah. It seems to be, it would make a lot of sense that this would be, that demonizing the, the northern kingdom would have been a, a preoccupation of, of Josiah's era because this was right at the time when, you know, he was trying to, for one thing, s centralize the cult in Jerusalem and had uh, expansionist aims, you know. 
because the northern kingdom had been wiped out basically by the Assyrians, and then so there's a lot of open territory, etc. So, yeah, it seems like this, if this was seventh century, this these writings, it really fits into there really nicely. It seems like. I, I think he pretty well has them. I'm sorry. I think he pretty well has them dead to rights with that, um, with the the prophecy that the great King Josiah is going to come and restore. The I mean, yeah, that just nails it down right there. Yeah, that was a big one. I want to read that. I I actually forgot about that. I can't believe I did. But that was that's huge. I mean, where was that? In, is that in chapter six too? Yeah, I think it is in chapter six. Yeah, it's um First Kings thirteen one through two. Uh, what what did you say that it was again? Thirteen. Um, my notes say First Kings thirteen one and two. Yeah, and behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing by the altar to burn incense, and the man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice upon you the priests of the high places who burn incense upon you, and men's bones shall be burned upon you. And they go in to say, well, this is exactly what happened, too. I mean, Josiah basically smashed the shrines uh, in the northern kingdom and, and killed the priests and basically burned them up at these old shrines as to basically stamp them out. So, yeah, that, that really, to me, seems... I mean, just, 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 just grabs you and says, yep, yeah, this is Josiah. This is from Josiah. Yeah, I forgot about that. Thanks for reminding me, Shauna. That's huge. Wayne says he's confused on Jeroboam controlling just Judah, as that would cause Simeon south of Judah to cut off from the northern tribes. Well, that's what we were talking about because in that, when, what was it, Abijah or Ahijah or whatever, Ahijah? What name? Huh? I think it's Ahijah. Yeah. Gives the ten, rips his clothing, gives ten tribes to, to the north, right? Right. No. Yeah. But I thought Jeroboam was the northern, and he just got one. No, Jeroboam was the north, and he got ten. Rehoboam was Solomon's son. Oh, yeah. That's... Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, I was just clarifying that. I, I don't really have an answer to this question. I'm hoping somebody else is going to jump up with that. Well, Reuben said that the Levites wouldn't have been counted. Is that what you were saying, Ruben? Because they didn't have an inheritance other than just temple duties? Um, I think that what Wayne is talking about, though, is that you're actually causing that there's an actual geographical cutoff. So that the I'm not looking at a map, but I think he's saying that the tribe is, that the territory of Simeon is south of Judah. So how does it get connected up with Israel, if that's the case? Is that right, Wayne? Exactly. Let me see if I can map a tribe inheritance. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so let me present. Oh, there we go. Reuben did it. Perfect. Yeah, Simeon's right smack in the middle of Judah. So he was one of the, was he one of the ten, was that one of the ten given to Jeroboam? Do you guys remember? Let me see if I can find that again. This one's 64. It's kind of looking at, at that map. I think I count um, ten tribes in the north, 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We have Reuven, Benjamin, Dan, Ephraim. I'm sorry, my, my screen's messing up. Reuven, Benjamin, Dan, Ephraim, I don't know, uh, I don't know Gad, Manasseh. Oh, oh, there's two Manassehs. Maybe I was counting them twice. Issachar, Zebulon, Naphtali, and Asher. That's ten. And so do, may, does Simeon not really, um, has Simeon not split off from Judah at this point? Yeah, because here in, on page 150 it says the tribes of the north are Benjamin, Manasseh, Ephraim, Zebulun, Asher, Naphtali, and Dan. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, because, yeah, because the Ju Judah and Simeon are described in, um, well, Joshua and Judges, right? For sure in Judges. Because Judah and, Judah and Simeon were the ones that actually were able to stamp out the Canaanites. Contra Joshua, contra the book of Joshua. Because in Joshua, isn't it saying that all the tribes, basically, that all the Canaanites were were basically stamped out? But then at the end, it says, well, a few were left. Or is that the beginning of Judges? I forget. Sorry, I, I didn't quite hear all your question. I'm I'm experiencing a few technical problems here. Oh, I was just speculating on them. It says uh, Reuben says, "Are we in agreement that Dan and Simeon are at least partially descended from non-Israelites?" Um, sounds reasonable to me. It does seem like, though, I remember there being, depending on where you look, that there are a, a few different tri listings of the, the, the tribes. Of, the listings of the tribes don't always match up, much like much like the listings of the apostles in the New Testament. Well, we can can't really know because it doesn't say the 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 um that prophet or whatever Abijah is that how you said it was or Ahijah he doesn't actually say um who's going where he just says ten I'll give you ten tribes but Rehoboam will have one tribe. It doesn't actually list them. Like who's going where. Anyway... Do um, you guys have anything else? Anything else you liked in the reading or questions or anything like that? Mm, nope. I did have an observation because I had a question. I didn't understand something, but then I found out from another source, so it's, <laughs> it's not an issue anymore. Gotcha. You know what's really weird is if 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 uh, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, etc., all the Deuteron Deuteronomistic history was written down under Josiah, why the heck 
are Judges and Joshua so different as far as the conquest of Canaan? Like, they're just totally contradictory on a lot of things. And if, it, if this was all written down by some team of scribes or by some scribe or something, like, why the heck are they so different? It makes me wonder if, like, Joshua was written by Judah and maybe Judges was, like, incorporated and it was like a northern account. Yeah, I mentioned there was a theory that Josh was not part of the Deuteronomic history. I think that it's a later it's a later writing that was possibly written during the Persian period in order as as propaganda for the returning colonists. That I'm talking about the book of Joshua. So so Judges would be the earlier book. Well, and Judges has a lot of old stories that it's it's not all that, um, I guess, coherent of a book, unified of a book, and um, it may be also that they don't really have a lot of choice when, they, when they're bringing up the stories from Judges that people know the stories better, and so they don't have as much room to um, play around with them. Yeah, Joshua could easily be a later story, like you say, for propagandistic purposes. And it really doesn't matter if it contradicts, you know, the story of Judges, if you just place it chronologically before, you know, kind of uh, make some of those obvious things disappear. It's only in, you know, modern critical thought that things are examined in that way. I mean, but, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's that's it. I mean, you know, you look at the story of the Exodus in general, and there are contradictions just right next to each other in the text. In You've which got, book? Well, I, I'm not sure which book right off, but I'll, I'll tell you one thing that I'm thinking of. You know, you've got the story that people are starving. You know, God is having to, you know, send poison doves down to them from the from the sky, and they're grumbling because they don't want to have eat have to eat manna every day. And then all of a sudden, they stop. You know, they put up their tabernacle. They have a big old feast. They slaughter thousands of animals. And yeah. then the next chapter, they're starving again. I mean, you know, that just to that totally doesn't make sense at all. Well, that's where you. I bet you those there's an insertion by a different source in there in that in that in the in between the two starving scenes, you know. Yeah, I have to show you how to uh, use Logos to to color code the ice field mm -hmm. sources because he also does Joshua too as part of the um, JEPD. Yeah. Well, it's interesting what you said about the chronological thing, because I was thinking when I was reading Joshua and Judges, like, if you assume ev if you assume everything in Judges happened after, which a lot of it did, because these Judges ruled for, you know, sometimes a few decades. But in Joshua, it seems like they pretty much wiped out the Canaanites, other than a couple spots, I think it says, where they became slaves. Um, but then you go to judges in cities that were said to have been conquered in Joshua's campaign are just Canaanite cities, and they have to be, you know, conquered in judges. So it's like, what happened? Did, did the Canaanites retake over the city? You know, or is it... it I mean, that's take a whole lot of... Yeah. It wouldn't take much of harmonization and apologetics to dispose of those problems. I'm sure, I'm sure there's a large body of uh, literature yeah, oh yeah, that Reuben's that. aware of that probably knows exactly how they uh, reconciled any kind of any problems they might have seen if they even saw any problems. Yeah. Well, well it's back. hard to miss them. I mean, the books are back to back, and it's like as soon as you, as soon as it at the end of Joshua, where it's summing up the campaign, then the book ends and you go right into Judges and it's like, wait a second, what? Right at the beginning of the Judges, you start running into problems with what you just read in Joshua. But yeah, um, I'm sure 
the sure. question of the tribe of Simeon, um, Wayne, you might want to read the just read the Wikipedia or um, Wikipedia article on the tribe of Simeon. Just Google that, um, and it it seems to indicate that that the territory of Simeon was maybe a little bit slippery. We we see this on the map the way it is, but that they may not necessarily have always been in that in that territory that they have mo they may have moved around some. Yeah, Reuben also mentioned Joshua as part of the Hexateuch. Not all scholars agree, though. A lot of scholars place it as the first book of the Deuteronomic history, and they even have what what they claim are Deuteronomic sources in Joshua, and some scholars totally disagree and have no Deuteronomic sources in Joshua. So it's depends on who you're listening to. Yeah. There was one site I found, in case you guys are interested, um, I thought I bookmarked it. Oh, no, I didn't. I can find it again. You know, I had this, this, um, this vision of uh, Joshua as be having been written during the Persian period as uh, propaganda for the returning colonists because I was reading the book actually at the same time as I was reading that McGee book I've mentioned earlier or uh, of how the Persians created Judaism and so it just seemed to dovetail so perfectly as to what they would be telling these people before they were sending them back, you know, don't don't intermarry with those folks that are there, and just remember how Joshua, you know, conquered those people and got rid of them, and they were able to take this lush and beautiful land, and they make promises to the people that you will be able to to harvest grapes from vineyards you did not plant. Wasn't it also implied that? Um the uh, Persian takeover with the returners was in some cases violent so that a lot of that actual destruction was not did not apply to an earlier period but was very much characteristic of the uh, return period post -ex exactly um, actually I think the return the return period is, seems to be very mysterious as far as what actually happened and some think that there were that there were more than one wave of colonists that came back, and that maybe the first wave that there was actually a lot of violence involved. Is it possible that I mean Yahweh? Isn't there some glimmerings that Yahweh was possibly? Like a, a Canaanite, you isn't there like Ugaritic texts that seem to hint that Yahweh was like a Canaanite god? Right. Well, I think they actually have references, but in Ugaritic, I think it was a different form of the name, which scholars assume is like an earlier version of Yahweh, like Yao, things like that. Wow. Okay. Um, but yeah, there, there's no question that uh, that Yah was also part of the Canaanite pantheon. Well, it makes me wonder, like, did all the people who got exiled, were they all Yahweh worshippers? Or was there a diversity like there was in the northern, seems to have been in the northern kingdom where... It's the biblical like, story, <laughs> you know? Huh? That's a biblical story, you know, that Yahweh was the God of Judah. They went in exile, and they took their Yahweh's beliefs with them. Right, but I'm wondering, historically, do you guys think that that's right, or do you think that that, that, they, that even among the exiles that there was a diversity of, of who, who the gods were worshipped? Or did, or did Yahweh worship even get standardized, if you will, among the exiled Jews, and then they came back, and or probably not because Josiah already was. Yeah, that wouldn't work out. Well, I know McGee's theory, but I won't really go into it right now. 
Up to 70%. It's online, free. Yeah, I might check it out. Of course, the uh, a alien dinosaur stuff makes me a little... Well, there are aliens. dinosaurs in this. And, 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 you know, we don't have to exactly... Um, we, we don't have to exactly accept everything he says at face value. It's just a pretty interesting analysis and theory that, you know, we could go over, look at, blow up if necessary, if we have the means to do so. Yeah, I, I, you're right. I mean, it, there's probably a lot of good info in there, even if you don't include this kind of conclusions necessarily. Um, well, you guys want to wrap it up, or did anyone have any final thoughts or anything like that? I wanted to read one part at the very end of Chapter 7, if, if we're all done. I'm done. We're I good? Think, yeah, I brought up everything I had in my notes. Dale or Wayne, did you guys have anything else or want to say anything else or re read an excerpt you liked or anything like that? I'm good, thank you. Okay. Or David. Yeah, or David. Or Reuben. Feel free to read the passage if you want, Reuben. Reuben should learn how to possess people and we could be his mouthpiece. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, at the end of chapter 8, the ultimate villains, page 194, I'm sorry, end of chapter 7. The writer of the Books of Kings was concerned to show only that the Omrides were evil and that they received the divine punishment that their sinful, arrogant behavior had so richly earned. Of course, he had to recount details and events about the Omrides that were well known through folk tales and earlier traditions, but in all of them he wanted to highlight the Omrides' dark side. Thus he diminished their military might with the story of the Aramean siege of Samaria, which was taken from events of later days, and with the accusation that in a moment of victory Ahab disobeyed a divine command to utterly annihilate his enemy. The biblical author closely linked the grandeur of the palace at Samaria and the majestic royal compound in Jezreel, which we actually have archaeological evidence for, with idolatry and social injustice. He linked the images of the awesome might of Israelite chariots in full battle order with the Omrides family's horrible end. He wanted to, to delegitimize the Omrides and to show that the entire history of the Northern Kingdom had been one of sin that led to misery and inevitable destruction. The more Israel had prospered in the past, the more scornful and negative he became about its kings. So yeah, they're saying propaganda, basically, under Josiah. Anyway, final thoughts? No? Okay, well, um, we will talk about how much we're going to read next time after we go off live. So thanks, everyone, for joining us, and uh, see you next week. Same bad time, same bad place.